Well, hi there, boys and girls. This is Captain Kangaroo. Say, I'd like you to meet a friend of mine. So, you know, it's lots and lots of fun to have a pet that you can run and play and jump with, isn't it? But did you know that there are some boys and girls who can't run and jump and play? It's all because of a thing called polio. When I think of bad historical assumptions about correlation and causality, I think of polio 100 years ago when it was this horrible mystery that it was, you know, claiming a lot of lives, and it was really scary because it mostly struck children. And uh, there was a strong line of research that suggested that ice cream caused polio, that ice cream consumption caused polio. Here comes Mr. Salty, the soft ice cream man. The creamiest, creamiest soft ice cream you get from Mr. Salty. The reason that that correlation was thought to be causal was that um, polio spiked in the summertime um, for reasons that really weren't very well understood, but it did. And ice cream sales spiked during the summertime. So these researchers had seen that whenever there was a lot of ice cream being sold and consumed, there was a lot more polio. And so there was really literally the beginnings of this kind of ice cream persecution to try to stomp out polio. And it sounds ridiculous, um, but you see it all the time now, people trying to fight against or build up something that they're sure is connected to something else, which it turns out just isn't. We have a crime problem that is now out of control. All over the country. I am pro-choice. I believe in Roe versus Wade. Extremists bomb more than 30 clinics across the country. People like you allow babies... You never give brain. voice to the real experiences of women. Okay. When I started studying crime in the early 1990s, it was roughly at its peak, the highest it had ever been in the United States. And all the experts expected it would go higher and higher. The warnings were everywhere. But then, much to everyone's surprise, Something happened. Well, I don't know. I guess you're right. I suppose it'd been better if I'd never been born at all. What'd you say? I said I wish I'd never been born. Homicide rates went up in half of the nation's city. 373 homicides last year, up 65.7% over 1987. Murder is a national problem, up an average 11% across the country. In Bucharest tonight, deposed communist leader Nicolae Ceausescu and his wife have been executed. Pictures of the former communist dictator lying in state executed by firing Crime squad. Crime and violence are now the top concerns of many Americans. You've been given a great gift, George. A chance to see what the world would be like without you. As the 1980s drew to a close, law enforcement experts predicted that the crime wave of the preceding decade would continue to rise. It would be the decade of the mega criminal. There was only one problem. It didn't happen. Across America, the crime rate is down. The FBI has some good news about crime. It's down. It's clear the numbers are dropping. What's not clear is why. What's behind this dramatic change? Primarily, it's the police, police strategies. We have incarcerated our criminals and thus taken out of the population of those people who would commit crimes. Experts and officials lined up to offer explanations for the drop in crime. Community police officers, better prevention. Their explanations included more innovative policing, harsher criminal sentences, changes in the crack market, increased gun control, a strong economy, and more police on the streets. But economist Stephen Levitt examined these explanations, evaluating the most popular ones. When you look at the data carefully, it's just not clear that they really have that impact that people have suspected. By analyzing the reasons most often cited by those in the press, Levitt was able to separate the more likely factors from the less likely ones. The crime drop explanation most often cited was that innovative policing strategies had been introduced in some cities. New York City, for example, implemented sweeping law enforcement changes from Police Chief William Bratton's ComStat system to Mayor Rudolph Giuliani's crackdown on small street crime. The reductions in crime that have taken place in New York City are pretty close to miraculous. New York City had among the biggest declines in crime of any city in the country. So there's an enormous amount of fanfare given to the strategies of Giuliani and Bratton. But crime fell everywhere. It's hard to find any city in the United States where crime didn't plunge. And also, crime was down 20 to 30 percent before Giuliani ever took office. So a number of things make me suspicious that it really was the policing strategies. 
The second reason most cited for the crime drop was an increase in the reliance on prisons. We've locked up a million more Americans since the early 1990s. There are now two million Americans in prison, and that's got to be due to crime. Levitt recognizes that imprisoning more people will, in the short term, bring crime rates down. By my estimates, about 30% of the decline in crime can be attributed to the fact that we got very tough on crime in terms of locking up criminals. This is crack cocaine. The third explanation for the crime drop most often cited in the press were changes in the crack market. Now, experts say crack cocaine may finally be on the decline. The peak of the crack epidemic came in the late 80s and the early 90s. And at that time, an enormous amount of the homicide in particular could be attributed to crack. But for various reasons, the amount of violence that's been associated with the crack trade really faded. That's not the move no more. So that can explain about 15% of the decline in crime. Other possible reasons for the crime drop examined by Levitt include tougher gun laws, the 1990s economic boom, and an increase in police nationwide. So Levitt does not entirely discount these. He sees them account for only a small fraction of the overall crime drop. There are a million factors that drive crime, but how do you determine the particular composition? Overall, what Levitt found from all these reasons was that taken together, they only explained about half of the 1990s crime drop. The other half remained a mystery. So what happened? Well, let's rewind to what for many Americans may have seemed an irrelevant incident in a faraway place. When Romanian dictator Nicolae Ceausescu was executed by his own people on Christmas Day, 1989, it marked the end of a brutal totalitarian reign that had lasted 24 years. In his earliest days, Ceausescu's Romania faced a struggling economy, and he sought to vastly increase the workforce. To achieve this, Ceausescu outlawed abortion in 1966. Agents known as the Menstrual Police rounded up women to give pregnancy tests and tax the infertile. Across Romania, women were forced to have children, and they could no longer choose when it was right to do so. Romania's birth rate doubled but more and more births across the country were, not surprisingly, unwanted and resulted in troubled upbringing. Of the infants forcibly born that first year, more did worse in school, suffered poor job performance, and were thus more likely to become criminals than those born the previous year, even controlling for the age, income, health, and education of the mother. But what do events in Romania a long time ago have to do with crime in America in the 1990s? According to Stephen Levitt, a lot. You've been given a great gift, George. A chance to see what the world would be like without you. What I believe to be true, and I think the evidence supports it, is a hypothesis which many people find jarring and disturbing. But nonetheless, I believe is probably right. Good evening. In a landmark ruling, the Supreme Court today legalized abortions. In 1973, in a case called Roe v. Wade, the Supreme Court ruled that abortion, which had previously been legal in only five U.S. states, would now be legal nationwide, precisely the opposite of what happened in Romania. The legalization of abortion in the 1970s was one of the primary reasons why crime fell in the 1990s because a whole generation of potentially unwanted children were never born because of the legalization of abortion. And if you fast forward 20 years to the point in time when they were going to be at their peak crime ages, they simply weren't there to do the crime. You see, George, you really had a wonderful life. Don't you see what a mistake it would be to throw it away? The trouble, of course, is that life isn't like the movies. For so many children who, without Roe v. Wade, would have been born in 1973, their lives might not have been the wonderful lives of being born into a loving family in yesterday's small-town America. Rather, theirs would be the far harder road of being born into a potentially unwanting household in America's crumbling inner cities or forsaken heartland. Levitt's conclusion, as much as half of the 1990s crime drop was an unintended consequence of Roe v. Wade. 
the theory behind it is actually quite simple. Unwanted children have been shown to be at high risk for crime. With legalized abortion, fewer unwanted children were born. Therefore, the theory would be that there would be less crime 15 to 20 years later when those cohorts reach their peak crime ages. And the data support that hypothesis quite strongly. If you follow the data, there were five states that legalized abortion three years before Roe versus Wade, and about 15 years later, their crime begins to fall three years before the rest of the country. Then, if you look at the states where abortion was not just legal, but easily available to people who wanted to get them, 16, 17 years after Roe versus Wade, you see a 30% difference between the states doing a lot of abortions and the ones who are doing very few. Finally, all of the effect we see in the divergence in crime, all of that is concentrated among people under the age of 25, people young enough to have been exposed to legalized abortion. People older than the age of 25, there's no difference whatsoever between the high abortion states and the low abortion states. And I think in some ways that's the best evidence we have that legalized abortion is responsible for a big chunk of the decline in crime. Levitt's controversial theory has provoked strong reaction among critics. Is he, for example, advocating abortion as a crime-fighting tool? In no way would I take this as advocacy in favor of legalized abortion. I don't think anyone's opinion about whether abortion should be legal or not should be affected by our results. Some of Levitt's critics suggest that his theory holds what might appear to be class or racial implications. He argues, though, that race and class have nothing to do with the matter that his theory targets no specific group other than mothers-to-be of all backgrounds. And since, as Levitt points out, women who elect to abort go on to become childbearers consistent with the general population, Levitt's argument could thus be understood to suggest that legalized abortion does not so much prevent birth as delay it. This turns an unwanted birth by a two-young mother, for example, into a wanted birth by that mother when she feels more ready. So, if Levitt is not advocating abortion as a crime-fighting tool, what is he advocating? Well, whether one is pro-life or pro-choice or somewhere in between, there is a meaningful and to date unimpeached connection between giving women the right to choose and a reduction in crime. Our incentives, unlike everyone else's, are to be honest. Because we built our whole reputation on if we're honest about this issue and we're honest about this other issue, then people will believe us we're honest about everything. So the worst thing we could do, the only way we can ruin our reputation is by starting to take sides in fights. In some sense, we're this peculiar beast which actually has the right incentives to just seek the truth and not have an agenda. So I don't think anything we've ever written or thought is gonna save any lives really, or you know, make people smarter or better in any way, but we kind of give people permission to challenge conventional wisdom sometimes, and to ask a different kind of question entirely. And a lot of times the questions are the, the sort of questions that you asked as children, and uh, you know, people kind of chuckle at you, and, but once in a while they turn out to be really good. The problem is that as you get older, and like you ask them as adults, like if you're in a meeting or with your friends or whatever, then they laugh at you hard, and you just kind of stop asking those questions entirely. And that's, we just kind of keep doing it. We kind of say, what if this thing that everybody thinks is so really isn't so, or what if that didn't cause this, and what if this caused it? And I think that there just needs to be a lot more permission for people to think like that. Total BS, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah.